Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Pros and Cons of Analgesic Use During Inhalation Anesthesia, presented by Ignacio Alvarez Gomez de Segura, ECLAM diplomat, ECVA diplomat, professor, anesthesiologist of University Complutense, Spain. I am Alexis Corrales of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labberts. Labberts is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the accreditation button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dr. De Segura. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation, for staying here with you. And we'll try to give you an overview of the use of analgesics during anesthesia or during the perioperative period, and try to focus on the pros and cons on the use of these analgesics. So we will review the current practice on perioperative analgesic use and try to describe mainly focusing on these analgesic effects the positive and the negative effects on analgesic action. We are using analgesics uh, during research with animals, although they may produce some interference with our, our scientific results. However, we all know that withholding analgesics in an animal that is likely to suffer from pain may also produce negative consequences usually some degree of pathophysiological changes on the animal that may also impair or modify our results, scientific results, and is a negative consequence for the animal well-being. So these consequences besides suffering involve an uncontrollable source of variability. So that means that we may even re require more animals to get the necessary results or good quality results. So we always use analgesics in our animal models. Every time we expect an animal uh, suffering from pain because of the procedure, surgical procedure or whatever that might produce pain, we need to use analgesics. However, at some points, the requirement for analgesics can be lowered. That means that the degree of pain suffered by animal can be light or even moderate. Then we might consider the use of different analgesics. However, in other instances, uh, researchers may consider to use analgesics just even in the case pain is unlikely to occur. And that might be good the ethics committee may consider this to be a refinement. However, we should consider that the analgesic use may also produce some negative responses or effects. Why are analgesics not routinely administered to animals? There are several reasons. Probably one of those may involve that researchers may think that pain protects the damaged area that analgesics may produce side effects and also that may interfere with the scientific results. Also because we still don't know the most effective doses to be given to a, a specific species, for example rodents compared to dogs and cats, where there are much more studies try to identify the, the best doses for them. 
And finally, because there might be some regulatory constraints, for example, the limitations on the use of uh, opioids, potent opioids, under legal control. So probably we may have, as researchers, a lack of information related to the best way to provide analgesia to our animals. So what about the perianesthetic use of analgesics? I'm saying anesthetic because we may consider the use of analgesics when no pain is expected, for example, because the procedure is not painful, so analgesics might not be required, although they may reduce the dose of anesthetics we may use as well. For example, it's quite common to produce sedation with opioids such as methadone, and they may reduce the amount of anesthetics we are using, thus reducing the adverse effects produced by the higher doses of the anesthetic. However, we may consider at the same time to avoid the use of these drugs, simply because we don't need analgesic at all, actually. On the other side, when pain is expected, for example, for surgical procedures, they should block all nociceptive input. They should significantly reduce anesthetic requirements. And the reuse is usually highly recommended or even mandatory. We should consider nociception against pain. Nociception is the neural process of encoding noxious stimuli. And pain sensation is not necessarily implied, for example, during anesthesia. Pain, on the other side, requires unconsciousness. Sorry, consciousness. On the contrary, nociception can be produced during anesthesia that is, during unconsciousness. So we should probably define antinociception as the way we are using analgesics during anesthesia. And many people will consider this as providing intraoperative analgesia. So possibly we may require to use analgesics and actually, most of them will provide hypohalgesia. We are referring to hypohalgesics as those drugs producing a lower degree of pain perception or pain sensation. So analgesia, the total absence of pain perception is desirable, but probably not clinically acceptable. Why? Because high doses of analgesics may produce full analgesic effects, but at the high cost of adverse effects. So the idea, the clinical idea, is to provide analgesia just to ensure pain is absent, but sometimes just tolerable by the animal. The overall treatment or pain management involves prevention, that is administration of analgesics before pain is perceived, for example, before surgery. The selection of analgesics together with the dose and the duration of the drugs. And finally, the assessment that the drugs administered are producing the desired effects. Analgesia or pain perception is processed through different, for different processes. The first one is transduction, where the noxious stimuli are transferred to an electrical signal. Then the signal is transmitted by a first order neuron and then transferred to the spinal cord, can be modulated by increasing or decreasing the pain perception or the noxious stimuli, actually, and then is finally perceived by the cortex, by the brain. So at every level of these four processes, we can use different drugs or we have different targets. So actually, since many substances and pathways are involved, similarly, we should treat pain with different drugs 
and different pathways. So clinically, probably no single drug is fully effective to produce analgesia when we are dealing with severe pain, such as that produced by surgery. What are the drugs we are using to promote analgesia preoperatively? Usually, we are using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We are using also opioids, and we usually combine them. And finally, local anesthetics. Now, these three group of drugs are considered the mainstay for producing analgesia to animals and people as well. So we should combine all of them. We might consider other drugs as well, newer drugs, to produce these effects or increase the efforts produced by these three groups of, of drugs. So non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs should provide analgesia for light to moderate pain. They may reduce surgically induced tissue inflammation and derive pain, but they do not re reduce or little anesthetic requirements. These drugs are usually administered before surgery because they may better prevent inflammation while surgery is start or being produced. Opioids provides analgesia for moderate to severe pain. They do not reduce surgically induced tissue inflammation. And there are regulatory, tight regulatory constraints for some of them, for example, for morphine, methadone, or fentanyl. These drugs are usually provided before surgery, just to cover the intraoperative period by providing antinociception, and then to provide analgesia in the postoperative period once the animal has recovered. The typical opioids we are using are divided in three different groups. The mu agonist, like morphine, methadone, fentanyl, or remifentanyl, may provide the highest level of efficacy, analgesic efficacy. However, they are highly controlled, and at some institutions, they are difficult to be achieved or used. Partial agonists, like buprenorphine, may provide a lower degree of analgesic efficacy, although high compared to other analgesics. And finally, agonist antagonists, like butorphanol, probably produce the lowest level of analgesic action among the different opiates we are using clinically. Local anesthetics are the only drugs that may produce or may fully block nociceptive input. So they are an excellent option to be combined with the previous drugs. They reduce anesthetic requirements of simply because they are blocking all nociceptive input. However, we must be sure that the application of the drugs are appropriate, so there is no such nociceptive input uh, to the spinal cord or to the brain. Another advantage is that it can be easily applied, for example, at the bone site. There might be, or they may actually, other methods to control pain or manage pain. Actually, there are many peripherally or centrally mediated substances that may promote analgesia physiologically and also uh, from a therapeutic point of view. So probably in the next few years, we will, run, we will find many other type of drugs that may produce adequate analgesia to our animals. Now, we'll try to uh, identify the interaction that might happen between the use of different analgesics together with anesthetics. So, since inhalational anesthesia is the main way to produce anesthesia, of course, you can use injectable anesthesia and opioids may also, or other analgesics may also produce uh, or may potentiate the, the analgesic effect. So uh, most of the rodents and anesthetized are probably done uh, with the use of isoforane or sevoforane. And to identify the interference between analgesics and uh, inhalational anesthetics, we use normally the minimal blood concentration, the MAC, 
as a surrogate or as an index of inhalational, anesthetic inhalational potency. So we all know that the mean molecular concentration in the rat or in mice of isoferrin is 1.3 or around 1.3. However, we should keep in mind that every individual will have its own minimum alveolar concentration. So we should give some oh, you know, variability or provide some pro variability uh, on the potency of these drugs into the different individuals. At the same time, the MAC is really a function of nociceptive sensitivity to the stimulus itself. When we test or we determine the minimal barrier concentration, we are actually applying a nociceptive stimula, a stimulus. So many hysoferane or sevoferane sensitivity genes will also be nociceptive sensitivity genes as well. Anyway, despite the stability of the MAC, because the, the, the potency of isoferrane or seboferrane within a given species is relatively uh, stable or not too variable, actually, compared to, for example, injectable anesthetics. However, we should keep in mind that different strains may, give, may behave differently. When we combine them, drugs such as opioids with anesthetics, inhalational anesthetics, then we may expect a reduction in the requirement of anesthetics to maintain the same level of anesthesia. And typically, the reduction that we might consider clinically acceptable will be between 30 and 70%. Probably above 70% is too much and we may find some uh, drawbacks or some adverse effects derived from high doses of opioids, such as respiratory or cardiovascular depression. So we should balance the amount of opioids we are given to an animal together with the amount of inhalation anesthetics we are given just to ensure adequate level of anesthesia, analgesia, and at the same time to maintain physiological variables as physiological as possible. So typically, we use uh, different uh, studies with this experimental design. We uh, provide isoferrain or seboferrain to an animal, like a rat, and then we determine the minimal drug concentration for that individual animal, and then we give the opioid. Then once we, we give the opioid, we may expect a reduction in the minimal drug concentration, and at the same time, by repeating the MAC determination several times, we may also find the duration of the effort. Then, opioids consistently reduce anesthetic requirements. But, for example, non steroidals do not reliably reduce or just slightly reduce the anesthetic requirements. However, it's interesting to notice that the combination of opioids together with non steroidal anti inflammatory. Uh, drugs may provide some synergistic or additive efforts. That means that re the final reduction in anesthetic requirements is higher. Local anesthetics can also reduce anesthetic requirements, and those can be used as an infusion or can be given at the wound site. So, cutting or reducing nociceptive stimuli. This slide shows the typical dose response relationship between, for example, morphine on top and the anesthetic requirements of isoferrin. So, for example, one milligram per kilo may reduce 20% anesthetic requirements, while three milligrams per kilo may reduce close to 30%, and then 50% when 10 milligrams per kilo are provided to a rat. In another study, we found that we may achieve up to 80% reduction in anesthetic requirements. And these results are quite consistent. If we look to the figure on the bottom of the slide, then different 
opioids like sufentanil, fentanyl, remifentanil, or fentanyl have been used in order to reduce anesthetic requirements. And again, we may find slight reductions below 25%, up to 90% reduction in isoforan or seborforane use. These two studies all together from our lab show a similar dose-related response. So for example, buprenorphine may produce from 10 to 20% reduction with only 10 microns per kilo up to 50 to 55 more or less reduction when 100 micrograms per kilo are used. So by selecting appropriately the different doses of the different drugs, we may find which is the dose range regimen we should use to reduce anesthetic requirements and probably to produce more analgesia to our animals. This is the final slide where most known opioids used in the clinical setting or laboratory setting, uh, including, for example, butorphanol, buprenorphine, together with fentanyl or remifentanyl or morphine, also methadone or tramadol, they all can be produce a reduction in anesthetic requirements. And when properly selected, you may find that when low doses are considered, they may produce a reduction in anesthetic requirements between 25 and 50 percent. And then if you want to select the higher dose range, then you may provide the 50 up to 100, which is exceptional, 100 reduction in anesthetic requirements when, for example, methadone has been used. Interestingly, if you use methadone at 10 mm, milligrams per kilo, for example, and you compare this dose with five milligrams per kilo, you may notice that there's not any further reduction in anesthetic requirements. So that means that drugs like butorphanol probably will not provide any further advantage by increasing the dose. Rinfentanil is probably the most used opioid currently in the human setting. It is used also in the veterinary setting and may provide good, steady analgesia. However, the problem with fentanyl is that you should use an infusion uh, because the action of the drug, the analgesia actions may last only four to five minutes. So this is an advantage on one side because we may will adjust the level of analgesia at every time point of surgery or the procedure. But on the other side, once the, the infusion has been stopped, analgesia disappears. So the animal should be covered with other drugs, analgesic drugs. Again, there, are variability, there is a variability in the effects of isoforain depending on the strain so this is a typical demonstration on how different strains of mice, for example, may require different doses of anesthetics. And then on top of that, you may use analgesics to further reduce the amount of anesthetics you may require for your procedure. Another interesting uh, issue considering the use of uh, opioids or analgesics in general is that every time we are using analgesic, we may expect, expect a defined effect. For example, given room fentanyl of 120 micrograms per kilo per hour may reduce the sevofurane requirements by 20%. Some of some animals here, we saw some close to, I think, 180 uh, rats or individuals. Some of them mm, may have a higher effect. So the reduction may be up to 40 or close to 50%. However, and more interestingly, on the other side, on the left side, you may see that some animals may have a quite a different response. That means that even given remifentanil, they may require even more sevofurane 
to maintain the desired level of anesthesia. So not always we are going to uh, find a good effort of analgesics. We always aim to produce analgesia when analgesics are provided. That's for sure, that's obvious. However, analgesic administration does not guarantee adequate analgesia. So we always must ensure or assess that the analgesic effect has been produced to our animals. And finally, I would like to show you another effect recently found uh, and derived from the use mainly of opioids. Usually opioids may produce behavioral effects, may produce respiratory depression, especially in the human being, and cardiovascular depression. So for example, bradycardia and at some point hypertension may appear after a dose of, for example, fentanyl or methadone. However, recently there is more evidence telling us that there are also unwanted analgesic effects. First, because of the reduced efficacy of the drugs, mainly by chronic administration, for example, giving morphine to a patient with cancer may alleviate pain, but with time, the patient may require more and more doses or higher doses of morphine to prevent pain to occur. But on the other side, analgesics may also increase pain. And this is paradoxical because we are always expecting that an opioid may reduce pain, but not increase it. So how is that? It is well known that opioids may induce tolerance, but also hyperalgesia. Tolerance can be defined a pharmacologic response normally following repeat or prolonged opioid administration that is decreased or the, the analgesic effort has been decreased. And the pain thresholds are typically not modified. The reason for that can be that receptors are internalized, so they are not available for the effect of the drugs. However, when higher doses of opioids are given, then you may increase the analgesic effect. However, on the other side, opioid may induce also hyperalgesia. We should remember that we are respecting hypoalgesia or analgesia. So this is the opposite effect. Hyperalgesia has been defined as increased pain from a stimulus that normally provokes pain. And pain thresholds are typically reduced. So the effect is double. An opioid may produce analgesia or hypoalgesia on one side and may also produce hyperalgesia. However, why we are reducing these drugs? Because we are using them because they produce hypoalgesia or analgesia. And that's because hyperalgesia typically may appear after the analgesic effect. So this is one of our results we, we found some years ago when we were working on the use of remifentanil in rats. So we gave 120 micrograms per kilo per hour and this dose produced reductions, something around 25, 30%. And then we gave 240 to fall the dose of remifentanil and it actually produced a reduction close to 40 to 50%. And since we are given an infusion, we might expect to keep this level of anesthetic sparring effort for the time we are providing the analgesic. But surprisingly, what we found was that actually one hour and a half later, the reduction in anesthetic requirements were only one half, despite the levels in blood of remifentanil remain steady or constant. So when we stop the administration of the drug, then what was suspected was that the levels or the potency of the anesthetic uh, regain baseline values. So 
we were a little bit uh, impressed, not because uh, analgesics or opioids specifically were producing uh, tolerance or hyperalgesia, but because it was produced only one hour or one hour and a half the start of the administration of the drug. So that means that you may find that the frequency of the drug may be limited just or even during the perioperative period. So first we start by increasing the dose of uh, remifentanil. And in a similar study, then we increase from 120. Here you see the baseline on the left side, then the maximum effort of the drug, remifentanil, and then the reduced effort one and a half years hours ago. Then we increase the dose, we double the dose to 240 microns per kilo per hour of remifentanil, and again we reduce the anesthetic requirements. But again, one hour and a half later, the values were similar to those previously seen, and one half or more those suspected initially. So that means that these drugs, opioids, are not so efficacious in the medium or short term. Similar studies, for example, have shown that the administration of methadone at different doses may produce hyperalgesia. In this case, they use the tail flick test in conscious animals, in contrast to the previous study in the anesthetized animals. And we can see in female rats on the left or male rats that there's a reduction, or actually there's hyperalgesia, an effect of hyperalgesia, those related in all animals. So the idea oh, is that probably when you give a drug, you are producing hyperalgesia, and this is the blue box. This hyperalgesia has a reducing effect with time, and then once you stop giving analgesics, probably there's a hyperalgesic effect that may last longer actually. So let's say another way. So this is the antinociceptive effect uh, on the left side on top, pronociceptive effect below. Then we are given an opioid and the opioid should provide an analgesic effect. So that will mean to provide some level of antinociception. But this effort is reduced with time. Then once we stop the opioid concentrate of infusion, then there is a hyperalgesic effort. And this effort, we all know, sorry, we know, may last between three and four weeks in, for example, rodents and rats. So probably our hypothesis is that every time we are providing an opioid, we are giving an opioid to an animal, we are producing at the same time a hyperalgesic effort together with a hyperalgesic effort. And the balance between both will determine if we are finally finding analgesia or hyperalgesia. So, since there is an interaction between opioids and inhalation anesthetic, and since we saw this, this hyperalgesic effect of opioids, we hypothesized also that the MAC might be increased just by giving an opioid before anesthesia. And when I mean before, I mean at least one day before, not just a few hours before, a few minutes. So we were able to demonstrate that the administration of opioids in a first anesthesia may produce a reduction in the effectivity of this anesthetic in second anesthesia done one week later. The effect is slight, no more than 20%, but it can be evidence in these studies. So these two reports from our lab as well, so that the effect may last up to 28 days. For example, on top, in the figure on top, we see the administration of ring fentanyl is producing 
a reduction in the effect or in the potency of the inhalation anesthetic, so the MAC is increased. And in the lower figure, we see how the different drugs, buprenorphine, methadone, morphine, remifentanil, or tramadol, but not the control on the left side, may produce an increase in the MAC value when the second MAC determination was performed one week later. So it seems the effects are not related just only to remifentanil, but also to many other opioids we might consider, even those that might be considered to be less potent. And finally, recently we look to non-opioid drugs. In this case, we decide to study an interesting drug, which is metamisole. This drug uh, is not used in the United States or uh, Canada. However, it's quite popular in Spain, France, or Germany, as far as I know, or mainly because uh, in contrast to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, metamisole does not produce good anti-inflammatory action, but at the same time, does not produce uh, significant uh, side or adverse, adverse effects. So it's popular in the peripheral period. Then we test this drug together with uh, morphine and we compare, we gave these two drugs to rats and several days, two days and four days later, we found that uh, hyperergesia was present and similarly. So for example, when we test with the bone fry test, applying or testing mechanical thresholds, we saw that both drugs produce a similar level of hyperergesia. And quite similar when you consider in the, at the bottom of the, of the slide, when you consider the thermal one test. So should we give analgesics when required, considering that analgesics may produce at the same time the opposite effect, at least when opioids are considered? I don't think we should stop giving opioids because uh, these drugs are probably the best way to produce good analgesia to treat severe pain. Uh, the true relevance of these side effects are unclear, still unclear. And probably if you consider other drugs like local anesthetics, they are unlikely to produce these effects, although we didn't test these drugs in our studies. So, what are the potential, finally, strategies for the prevention of hyperegesia or tolerance? So probably these are first to potentiate the anesthetic effect of the, of the isoferrine or sevoferrine that is not reducing the MAC. And second, by preventing inhibit hyperegesia. So for example, in an early study, some 20 years ago, more or less, we considered the use of the gold standard of opioids, morphine, together with the gold standard of anti-inflammatory agents like uh, aspirin, acetaminophen. No, sorry, aspirin in this case, not acetaminophen. And then we found that one milligram per kilo of morphine produced a reduction of 20% that may be increased to nearly 30% with three milligrams per kilo or between 50 and 60 percent with 10 milligrams per kilo. So it's a clear dose-related response. However, when we gave aspirin together with morphine, one milligram per kilo, the effect was similar to that produced by three milligrams per kilo of morphine. So we might consider to reduce the dose of the anesthetic, but also the dose of the opioid given. The same might happen when three milligrams per kilo of morphine were combined with aspirin. And these efforts have been demonstrated in other or with other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and other analgesic drugs like paracetamol, in this case, acetaminophen. So for example, we use ketoprofen, paracoxib, and again, another drug not considered to be anti-inflammatory drug, dipirone or metamisole. These are two names 
we use for these drugs. Paracetamol is an interesting drug, and we've seen that it may potentiate the effects of opioids, like remifentanil, for example. And it's an interesting drug because it may not have, or actually does not have, anti-inflammatory effects. So it might be convenient for those studies where an anti-inflammatory effect is not desired, for example. Metamisole, as we already saw, may potentiate as well the effects of remifentanil. So it's an interesting drug to be given, but probably not to be used in places like the United States or Canada, where it's not available. Another drug we can use is ketamine. Ketamine is a quite commonly used drug to produce anesthesia in rodents, and actually it may potentiate in a dose-related uh, fashion the effects of remifentanil, for example. So you might consider to give a small dose of ketamine to produce this increased effect. Another interesting drug is gabapentin. Gabapentin also can produce an enhancement in the reduction of the MAC. So it's an interesting drug to be provided in some procedures. Other drugs such as amitriptyline, minocycline, or maropitan may produce also a decrease in the anesthetic requirements. Finally, another way to counteract hyperalgesia can be to prevent or inhibit this phenomenon. So for example, we consider the use of drugs such as ultra low doses of uh, naloxone, for example, or the antagonist of the TLR4. This is a non-opioid receptor. And the, and the rationale for this is that it is thought that opioids may not only induce activation of the opioid receptor, but also the TLR, TLR4 receptor. And when this receptor is activated, it may produce pro-inflammatory responses. So again, when using ultra low doses of naloxone, we were able to block the hyperalgesic effect of the drug but not, interestingly, not blocking the analgesic effect of the opioid, only the hyperalgesia. And again, when we were given uh, opioids, fentanyl, for example, in this case to knock out mice, uh, knock out for a TLR4 um, receptor, we were able to block the hyperalgesia produced by fentanyl. So, to finish, we may consider, still consider that opioids remain the most potent analgesics we may found to be used for the treatment of pain. But we should also consider that they also may promote anti-analgesic actions. However, the clinical relevance is still to be determined. Probably the combination of opioids together with other analgesic drugs, like usually like non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, local anesthetics, may promote a better analgesia and probably reduce the side effects, the analgesic side effects observed with opioids. Routine use of opioids probably for known or low painful procedures might not be considered. Anyway, we still need further studies to determine that but probably non steroidals may suffice for that. And remember always, every time you're producing a painful procedure, you may consider, you might consider, no, you may consider, sorry, the use of opioids, non steroidal and local anesthetics, maybe together with other cracks such as ketamine, but probably these drugs are less effective or few studies are known to to 
you know, to ensure the true validity or true efficacy of these drugs. Thank you very much. Let's get started. Our first question is, are opioids the only effective means to manage very painful procedures such as surgery? Opioids are the mainstay, uh, the mainstay for producing uh, analgesia for severe pain and probably we should still uh, use them on a routine basis. However, we should always consider the use of other drugs to produce analgesia. For example, the use of local anesthetics may produce a really good or potent analgesia to manage these very painful procedures. Our next question is, are opioid side effects irrelevant? Oh, we still don't know. Oh, we, we consider that opioids produce a really good analgesic effect and potent analgesic efforts, but while we are using them or we were using uh, these drugs over the last decades, we found that there are some uh, side effects uh, that we might consider. Probably the, the, the main concern would be the use of opioids when actually pain is not present in our animals. And we might consider then the use of other drugs such as non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Probably the relevancy of these side efforts uh, is not high anyway. Our next question is, does the combination of opioids with other analgesics provide any advantage? Oh, definitely. Uh, we, always, we should always consider the use of opioids together with non steroidals uh, for most procedures where pain is uh, likely to occur. And when surgery is produced, local anesthetics are or should probably be used as well. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Should opioids be employed in every potentially painful procedure? Oh, I still always, we, we should use opioids in, in every potentially painful procedure, specifically in severe or for severe pain. Uh, I don't think we are still able to stop using opioids to treat this, you know, severe pain. I would like to once again thank Dr. De Segura for his presentation. I would also like to thank Labberts for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of 2018. You will receive an email from Labberts letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.